Hi, I'm Professor Malus Peters, and in this short video, I'm going to cover some basic concepts of cyclic photometry, which is one of the many electrochemical techniques that we've got around. So, if you are working on sensors, it's very likely that you will have come across this technique. So, this is not something that's always traditionally taught in the curriculum, but you might get some more of it in uh, your master's level. And I'll explain to this why this is such a useful technique and what kind of basics you need to know. So generally, electrochemistry follows the reactions that involve electron transfer. So this can be that you're working with an analyte that's electroactive, but it could also be that you have a redox mediator. So electrochemistry has many, many different techniques, and cyclic voltammetry is only one of them, but it's one that's probably one of the most commonly used, and it's kind of a standard technique. So if you wanted to know something about your system, you probably look at cyclic voltammetry first. Clearly, the x-axis represents the parameter applied, so the applied potential, uh, or like what you normally see this as the voltage, and the y-axis uh, represents the response to this, which is in this case the current. What you can see here in cyclic voltammetry, and it's uh, cyclic, as you can see the shape, it's a cyclic pattern, so you apply potentials going back and forth. Uh, so typically you would start off at a lower potential, then you scan back to the higher potential, and then you kind of come back to this. And you can repeat this multiple times and have multiple numbers of scans to assess what is happening. And then most of the time we are interested in the oxidation and reduction reactions that are happening within the applied potential window that we are looking at. There's two different ways of, of conventions of how you would do it. Um, so I'm based in the UK, and for me the IUPAC convention, you see on the right where you have your oxidation uh, peak at the top and the reduction to the bottom, and you go from low to high potential. That's what I'm more commonly used to. And you can also kind of see the, the notation of the arrows, which indicates in which way your potential goes. So here we're talking about two different reactions, uh, and we know that in oxidation you lose electrons, and reduction you gain these electrons. If you have a typical reversible reaction, as you can see on the right, then you would have a symmetrical uh, pattern in your cyclic voltammetry. And I'll explain in the next slide why that's the case. But why do you actually have this electron transfer? So we can look at two different versions of it. We have a homogeneous electron transfer where you involve a chemical reactant. And here you can see that we look at the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And then we look at the highest occupied molecular orbital. And you will see that if overall your LUMO is at lower energy than the HOMO, you will see that these electrons can transfer. In scenario B, you can see that they're actually at the same level. But then when you use an electro or potential stat, you can see that the other one is bumped up. Uh, so then you get the same principle where your highest uh, occupied molecular orbital is at higher energy than the LUMO. So you get that electron transfer again. And in this video, I'll talk about two equations that are really important in cyclic voltammetry. And the first one I'll start off with is the importance of the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation, which you can see in the bottom, and there's different ways of how you can represent it, uh, because sometimes people use different symbols for it. But generally, that relates the potential of an electrochemical cell to the standard potential and the activities of the oxidized and the reduced analyte at equilibrium. And what we know is that activity is normally linked to the concentration. So you look at the concentration of the oxidized and the reduced pieces. So there are a couple of other standards in here. So you can see that obviously the Faraday constant, the temperature is very important. So you will see these changes with temperature. Uh, then we have the gas constant R. And we also need to look at the number of electrons that are involved in your reaction. Uh, so you can see this as a Z or sometimes as an N. So why do we then get the typical beak shape that we can see in cyclic photometry? So as you are scanning the potential, your concentration of electroactive species changes. Because we've seen before that if you apply a certain potential, uh, so remember that image where I showed you the difference between the molecular orbitals, uh, we change the concentration of electroactive species. So it means that if we are going in a certain direction, we'll see more of, of one, and then if we go backwards, we will see more of the other. And that's why if your reaction is completely reversible, we get this symmetrical pattern. Uh, and also to note that here in those images, I've only shown you one oxidation and reduction potential. But obviously, you have to imagine 
that for certain species you can have multiple peaks. So your spectra is not always that clean that you just have a single peak. Often you have multiple peaks in the system itself. So if you were to have a reaction which is irreversible, because for instance you're catalyzing a reaction or something is attaching to your surface, then it could very well be that you only see your oxidation or your reduction peak, or you see that they're not present at the same quantities. So there's some asymmetry in the system. And what you typically want to do, you want to cycle a decent number of times in order to make sure that your system is stable. And I'll come back to the scan rate in the next slide, as that's also very important because the time you give your system to react can also have an influence on the peak that you're looking at. The scan rate applies to how fast the potential is actually scanned. So typically this is somewhere in the millivolts per second range. For normal sensing experiments, we typically look about 50 millivolts per second, sometimes to 100, which is a little bit fast. And for certain reactions which are really slow, uh, then you can go down to 10 millivolts per second or even less. You also have to remember that the lower you make the scan rate, the longer your experiment will take. And for instance, for sensing, this is not very beneficial. But in some cases, you need to give it that time in order to react. Now, what I always find a bit counterintuitive, but actually when you increase the scan rate, you dec decrease the diffusion layer. So you measure higher currents. So it's very important that when you do your experiments that you keep all of these parameters the same. But what you can actually do is by changing your scan rate, there are some important processes that you can monitor. So if we have this reversible process, so where your cyclic voltammetry uh, is exactly like a symmetrical spectrum, we can look at one very important equation, which is the randall safchik equation. Now, in this equation, you can see, and in this case, the, uh, I've shown it as n, but that's the number of electrons involved in the reaction. And remember, that was that before. The Faraday constant, your surface area is obviously important. And then you'll see it depends on your scan rate and the diffusion coefficient. So if you see a nice linear increase, it means that you can verify the free diffusion of your analyte, and it also enables you to calculate the diffusion coefficient. And this diffusion coefficient depends very much on first of all, what you have in your system, your electrode. But so in my case, I often work with a polymer layer and these polymer layers tend to be porous for this electrochemistry. So whatever you're working with can still migrate to your electrode. This diffusion coefficient can also give you like a good understanding of the material that you have on your electrode and how that's working. So how do you measure cyclic voltammetry? So first of all, we need to, to work out between which potentials we are scanning. And the electroactive window, so that's from the lowest to your highest potential, that depends on quite a few things. So first of all, obviously, it depends on the electroactive species that you've got and their oxidation and reduction potential. So bearing in mind that usually you would do this under inert atmosphere, or at least you want to degas it with nitrogen, because, for instance, that can also be an influence of the atmosphere. And you will can see that actually has quite a significant influence on what your spectrum looks like. And then it depends on the electrode material. So bear in mind that certain electrode materials are not uh, completely inert, like for instance gold. And you might see peaks coming up which relate to your electrode material. And you need to take this into account. So the solvent is also important. And then it's also important to consider what electrolyte you're using in your system. But typically you wouldn't exceed something more than minus two to plus two volts. Uh, and actually you would narrow it down as much as possible. So you were only looking at the oxidation and reduction of the species that you're interested in and to avoid any side effects that relate, for instance, to your electrode or the solvent, etc. Now the most common setup that people look at is a free electrode uh, system. But for some commercial purposes, you can also work with a two electrode system, which is a bit easier to implement in certain cases. Now, what you, the first and probably the most important bit, that's your working electrode, because that's where your reaction is taking place. So for instance, if I work with the sensor uh, and I have specific materials that can recognize certain things, my electrode that's modified with these receptors, that's my working electrode. Now, then we also have the reference electrode. So the reference uh, helps in measuring and controlling the potential at the working electrode, but without passing any currents. And typically you would see that silver-silver chloride is the most commonly used system in this particular case.
Now what you can also have is the counter electrode and the counter electrode is also important because that needs to close the system. So that passes all the current needed to balance the current observed at the working electrode. So one of the fiddly things that you can sometimes have is because you have these three different uh, electrodes uh, which can't touch each other because otherwise it might short circuit. Uh, so you might want to work with like a specifically designed custom glass cell where you can easily enable this. Um, you also have certain electrodes, so like I work with screen printed electrodes, where you can have these reference and counter electrodes integrated onto the system itself. It makes it easier for you to go smaller. And in that case, the interesting thing of this is that you can, for instance, measure drops of liquid, because you can imagine that if you work with this system, you need quite a bit of liquid, and you'll be dangling your electrode in the liquid. Um, and particularly for sensing, if we're looking at uh, like real samples, we're looking at very small volumes. So you need to think about how you implement this free electrode working system. But as I mentioned, there's lots of other electrochemical techniques that you can use. So why would you use cyclic photometry? So in reality, in my in lab, what we mostly do, cyclic photometry is the kind of standard technique that you start off with. And the reason for it is because it's very easy to perform and because it, it gives you a lot of information straight away. And besides measuring analytes, you can also use cyclic photometry, for instance, for polymerization. So you can use it to deposit thin layers or like electro deposition onto your electrodes. So there's multiple functions uh, to this than just measuring. The other thing, so I've mentioned this randall sefcik equation, so you can look at the fusion coefficient, but you can also look at the stoichiometry of the reactions. So generally it's an easy thing to do, and because you can very visually see the peaks, it can be relatively easy to, to analyze uh, compared to some of the other techniques where you really need to optimize more in the system in order to get results. However, the disadvantages of the system is particularly if you have multiple peaks, it can be very complicated to, to discriminate between them. So that makes it quite challenging. So also if you compare this to, for instance, differential pulse photometry or square wave photometry, CV is not as sensitive as some of the other techniques. So for very specific sensing applications, it might be good as a starting point. It's not something that's very commonly used in commercial sensors. And also you have to remember if you do multiple cycles, you have to scan uh, forwards and backwards. So that means it can be a little bit more time consuming. And in most cases, you want the result as soon as possible. Then also the problem can be if you go towards higher potentials that you get a high capacitive background. So the problem is that some of the peaks then might disappear into that background. Thanks for watching this video. This was only a very brief introduction to cyclic photometry where I only touched on some of the basics. But if you want to know more about some of our other sensing projects, then do have a look at our playlist Bioinspired Materials. Thanks for watching.